We're going to start right in with a review of all of the things we were talking about last month in first level, just to refresh our memories um, about what we were talking about. Sorry about that. I'm flipping a little fast today. This is just to be funny, rule number one, but those are me, I call them rules. But on the first book of the training wheel, which you know is behind me, is rhythm. And you know, that translates to do no harm. And that means in our training, not to ruin the rhythm of the gates, do not affect the gates adversely. And that's our number one rule, sort of like a doctor, don't cause harm and so rhythm becomes very important not to damage the gates of the horse so rule number one rule number two you cannot make progress if the horse is not emotionally or physically relaxed enough to work with you and granted horses are supple naturally and show some flexibility but if they're upset they don't trust us we don't have harmony and they're too stressed to pay attention. They cannot retain anything, just like we can't. So they must not be forced or held. And so suppleness and relaxation is the number two spoke, which, you know, if you're over here looking behind me on the training wheel, there it is, relaxation. We talked about that last week. Rule number three, connection. And now we're in level two, and we're talking about being round to the connection and right on level two test it says the word reliability reliably on the bit in connection round to the connection round to the hand soft to the hand in balance showing some up self help i'm sorry some self carriage and balance so this is all together and whether you're in a bit or you're in a bothal or a bit less bridal being round and in connection is our verbiage, and it has to be reliable at level two. And we talked about this last month that that was the uh, level where you were going to achieve this in a very steady way so that you would be able to progress to second level, and now the word reliable. Number four, impulsion. The fourth wheel spoke right behind me, impulsion. And last month we talked about the fact that if your impulsion was not consistent and continuous, that you would have difficulties. You would have connection difficulties, balance difficulties. So continuous impulsion or energy in all the gates, because we were also talking about the fact that gated forces, some of them do have gates that do not have moments of suspension in their intermediate gate. And so if you're in an intermediate gate that has no suspension, we refer to it as energy or thrust rather than using the word impulsion, but energy in the walk or possibly in the gated horses. So we're talking about thrust and impulsion and that's needed to maintain connection, balance a steady tempo, and it's necessary to develop engagement and collection with lateral work. Without these four spokes, you don't go ahead. Number five, bend and straightness now in level two becomes more and more complicated. And we talked about the bend that was required in level one last month because we were talking about the loops and serpentines that are between the quarter lines and the 10 meter circles um, and the turns to the center lines. But now, in addition to these geometric figures, which were asked for, now are actually movements, shoulder in, haunches in. And these exercises are necessary to develop collection, engagement. The bend has to be on the outside aids. You have to um, exhibit correct pole flexion and positioning throughout the body known as bend. So now all of a sudden, the small bending that we were required to do in 10 meter circles and turns to the center line, that still has to be there. And now these movements requiring specific flexion and specific bending while maintaining staying on the bit, 
continuous impulsion, those are there with relaxation and without damaging, um, without damaging the rhythm. So if all of these spokes work, the last spoke is collection, which is that all of these five spokes worked together and collection develops. And now in level two, we're requested collected jog, collected lope. Those are two new level requirements. Collection is a byproduct or a result of rules one through five. <laughs> That's my little joke there. These are the spokes of the wheel. If it is carried out correctly, if those spokes are carried out correctly, collection occurs. And if there is collection, you will have some self-carriage, throughness, engagement, and if all of the all of the rules have been applied and everything's working properly, it develops correctly. Now, if development of collection is not occurring, review spokes one through five of the training wheel and address the quality or the detail that is needed to achieve good results. So, for example, you know, occasionally someone comes to me and says, no, I'm really excited. You know, I really want to go into level two, let's say, for example. And I haven't taught them before. And then we have the bad news of saying, um, you know, we didn't quite accomplish all of the exercises that uh, level one should have given you the skills. You're not really very steady on the bridle and the horse will not stay in a round connection while he turns to the center line and he doesn't stay in a round connection while he makes the turn to the diagonal or while he's in the 10 meter circle. And if he's not capable of maintaining his carriage or connection and his small amount of flexion or bend that's required for those exercises, they begin to flounder in level two. And so sometimes now comes the review because some of these spokes of the training wheel uh, do not develop correctly. And so go back and review the spokes of this training wheel and address the quality, start right down through with, is the rhythm okay? Is the horse relaxed enough? Is it okay with me? Is it comfortable in its tack? It's not stressed. Then number three, does it stay reliably round to my hand or in my connection? Oh, I don't put, I'm not putting a check mark there. And does it have enough impulsion to keep that connection? Oh, I got another check mark missing. Well, then I have to address those two spokes of my training so that I can progress to more advanced bending so that I get oh to God. collection of second level. So this is the part, and this is why I asked our judge trainer, Joanne Coy is on our call. She's an amazing large RWD judge, and she's the head of our judges education program. One of the things that is really a big deal about level two is that you do have to be reliably on the bit, show continuous impulsion with enough energy to produce engagement, show some uphill balance, show some care, uh, self carriage and collection. You have to exhibit bend and straightness. But number two, which is a big challenge in level two is that now you have movements which the movements themselves have specific requirements. For example, shoulder in must be three tracks. It must show pull rotation. It should have very slight bend or flexion and be approximately 30 or 32 degrees. Now in second level, you have not only the uh, geometric figures to carry out while staying reliably on the bit and showing continuous impulsion and connection, but now you have specific movements. And down here in the small print, which is the doubles and the detail, if both of these requirements are not fulfilled to be a five or above, if one part of this is met, but the other part is not, you can receive a score of four insufficient. For example, perhaps you have a horse that is really round to the bridle on the bit and it's active, it's showing impulsion, it has balance and it's uphill, but it does not achieve the three tracks and the shoulder in, it's in a leg yield. 
And so therefore in the movement that requests shoulder in, it would get a score of four because it met this part, but it did not actually do a shoulder in. So matter it's uphill, it's engaged, it's forward, but it didn't do a shoulder in. So therefore it could receive, it, it needs to receive an insufficient score because it did not do what it was asked to do, which is a movement shoulder in, which has a specific requirement. Now, jo Joanne's here to talk to us about this because judges uh, kind of kind of talk a lot about level two and the differences between level one and level two and what a big change it is. And Joanne, I was hoping you're gonna jump in and, and help us and talk to us about that. Okay. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, of course, you know, when you're um, evaluating a rider's movement, we have to look at the basics as Ida mentioned, that's primary. And then we have to look at the criteria of the movement. So you need to know what a shoulder in looks like as Ida just described and do an actual shoulder in as opposed to a leg yield. And then <laughs> the other thing we look at is uh, modifiers, you know, um, the little things like the size of the circle or the, um, was the horse, um, keeping the rhythm. That's a, that's a basic of course, but, um, plus or minus a half point generally is what a modifier does for you. And then, um, and then you put that all together and you come up with a score. So yeah, I is absolutely right. If the horse is doing a leg yield, as opposed to a shoulder in the criteria in the movement is not being met. So, you know, nice leg yield, but not a shoulder in. Um, would you, would you agree um, that we talk that judge as judges, that we talk a lot about what a jump it is from level one to level two, and not only in Western dressage, but also in dressage, uh, the difference between uh, the levels, the levels one, where the horses are really just in kind of large ge geometric figures, and other than leg yield, um, there's not anything too demanding there. They're just kind of keeping forward and keeping connected, which they're learning that skill. But then they get to second level and there's all these skill requirements, which for us is shoulder in, haunches in. Uh, you have to do either a pivot turn on the haunches and of course a side pass. And those are our two more skills uh, besides the shoulder in and haunches in. Right. And and. And the biggest thing is that the horse has to start accepting more responsibility in the hindquarters and coming through from back to front and carrying more weight onto the hindquarters, which is what develops that up, you know, the introduction to the uphill balance and early stages of collection. So um, a lot of times riders think that, well, you know, I've worked in level one for a year or so now it must be time chronologically to move up to level two. It's not a turning of the calendar page. It's it's whether or not your horse has the strength to use his hindquarters, come through from back to front and um, start lightening up the front end. Absolutely, yes. And that's that's sort of the part here about the that now the verbiage on the front of our test is using words like reliably and um, steady and I, this is my favorite word. I use the continuous impulsion, but the tests say all over them, they have to have steady impulsion and they're looking for loss of tempo, which is generally connected with lack of continuous impulsion. But continuous, the word continuous for a trainer is really good because it gets across to students that it has to be consistent all the time, sort of like the regulator on your car. Do you have it on cruise control? Cause it needs to keep up 55 at least. <laughs> And that is a concept which is very hard for us. We get to uh, working on the bending or the steering or the turning. And all of a sudden we're not thinking about the gas, the power that keeps the horse going. And without that engagement, um, self carriage and balance is very difficult to maintain. So we are, thank you. That was very clear for us. Um, bend is something that we're going to get into at a later call and in much more detail. And this is a little bit inaccurate. So I'm just gonna put this right out there to start with. 
there are lots of places on horses that they don't actually bend, but this is what um, judges are looking for. The areas where a judge thinks your eye, a trainer and a judge thinks that a horse bends, it's where you think you see uh, the body turning and bending. And this is what we, we talk about in uh, part of our biomechanical training. The pole itself, the uh, occiput backs right up to C1 and C2 right here. And a horse's occiput does actually swivel. And so a horse's head swivels like this. We know this, we can see it right here on this picture. Neck bend is one of those creepy things that people, until they really look at a skeleton of a horse, really don't understand. But we all know that the nuchal ligament is up here like a huge elastic. And when a horse bascules its back, which is really interesting, and that, that elastic pulls this way, it pulls these scapulas apart. And when that happens is when your back goes up which is amazing. So this, the way that the horse reaches forward to the connection through its neck with the nuchal ligament is part of this area lifting. And if the neck bends, you're thinking, well, this is a column, that's weird. We know horses can bend their necks around, but while that happens, it's amazing that these are swiveling as well as flexing sideways but the idea that they swivel and bend and turn sideways uh, in the neck is just amazing. And we have to keep reminding ourselves that in almost all of the lateral work that we do, that pole flexion is the number one part of bending, that a horse follows its pole. And without pole flexion, you have very little shoulder suppleness. The shoulders or positioning through the shoulders, which is the smallest amount of flexion through this you can ever imagine. This is not a true joint area. This whole area is supported by muscles, ligaments, cartilage, tendons. And this area flexes and it flexes sideways like front wheel drive cars and it bulges to some extent and it pops up. It's a very interesting area and although we refer to it as the five areas of bend it doesn't bend but the scapulas in this area do flex and they flex as a horse tracks going around and as it bends itself there's some flexion here the rib cage itself which is right here only flexes the maximum amount is three degrees and we remember that the lumbar, although it's capable of undulation up and down, it does not flex sideways at all. These lumbar lumbar are uh, steady and straight this way. They're a stabilizing force to a quadruped. The hips and the hindquarter area, which involves the SI, the sacroiliac, um, the hip, the stifle, uh, the hocks, the fetlocks, and so on, this whole hind leg uh, works all together to um, move weight from one side to the other. And while that's going on, the hips actually lower, uh, the joints take weight, there is some sort of swiveling. When you watch a horse go, your brain tells you that if the horse is bending around a curve, you think you see his whole body bending, but we've just talked about that there's areas that don't even flex at all. And that this, all of this joint area works like the universal joint in your truck, managing and distributing weight between the two hind legs and transferring weight back and forth so that the inside leg adducts around on a circle and that the hind legs, if properly ridden in what we refer to as bend, if properly managed by the rider, can track behind the front feet of the horse. So the word bend is a little bit of a misnomer. And also the five areas that you think your brain says that it sees bend, we're talking about flexion and about joint areas working together to redistribute weight. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because when a judge writes on the paper lacked bend, or they may say lacked pole flexion, or um, lack suppleness in the shoulders, uh, rib, rib cage, uh, lacks rib cage flexion, 
I mean, they may actually help you out and say where they didn't, they weren't confident about your bend or possibly hind legs not tracking is a really good one on a circle or uh, hunches, uh, hunches out. You know, if you just did a 10 meter circle and the hind legs are not tracking behind the front legs, hunches out on the circle, that's gonna indicate to you a lack of bend. So this is a quick review, believe me, uh, believe you me, this is not thorough. So this was just an idea because these are going to be talked about a lot as you progress in your own training by your trainers, uh, by the judges, you're gonna get comments. So we have to be a little clear about this. I'm gonna ask your patients to watch this video with me because I'd like to comment as we go along and Joanne may comment too. Some of you have seen this video. It's the video of shoulder in the Western dressage that I made for everybody. And please forgive me, you know how YouTube is. I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some ads, but there's two or three places we should definitely stop and uh, talk about a couple of things. One of the things that we wanna talk about within this is that one of the things that's happening for all of us is the ability to learn how to evaluate the shoulder in, which means that we have to learn how to see it. So in the beginning of the video is the descriptions from USCF that are in our rule book, which describe the exercise itself. You know, it should be in three tracks. The horse should be ridden in a slight but uniform bend at approximately 30 to 32 degrees. The inside foreleg passes in front of the outside leg. The inside hind steps forward under the horse's body following the same track of the outside leg and the lowering of the inside hip. The horse's footfall creates the three tracks and the horse is bent away from the direction it's moving. When we teach judges to learn how to judge shoulder in, okay, when judges are learning to judge, first of all, we go through all of those diagrams which show the three tracks and the description. Stop it again, please. Just wait a second, if you would, Dana. Can you bring her back to the corner for me yep. so that she's passing the corner? And one of the things that judges do is they're taught as the horse is approaching what should be the shoulder end. So let's say this test says, that she's gonna shoulder in on the center line and that um, you're looking, is this horse on the bit? So if, this is Joanne Williams, if everybody doesn't know. <laughs> this is Gigi and Joanne. And she was in the middle of the winter last year um, when, when the horse was still developing a lot of collection and she was freezing to death. So she did a great job taping this for me. Um, you're looking to see, okay, is she on the bit? Yes, does she look like she has good impulsion? Yes, does she? Look all together, harmonious, tail soft, eyes look great. So a judge looks at this as the horse approaches the shoulder in and they make a decision at that point based on, okay, I feel good about this. So if I was just judging this horse trotting around at second level, would I give a seven, seven, five or whatever? Yeah, I'd get a good score because this horse looks like it's balanced and it's ready to go. Now, when we push the button, she's gonna come up here and do a shoulder in. And now this is how you learn how to evaluate that. When this horse moves, you're looking that she gets on a line and from that line, because she's supposed to be doing shoulder in, her shoulders should go left of the line, not that she turns onto the center line and pushes the haunches out. If they do that, it's a fairly severe deduction, one or 1 1.5 because if you push the horse's haunches out and then you get into shoulder in by pushing the haunches out, you did not create collection. You pushed the horse sideways and you did not produce engagement because she didn't have to step onto her inside hind leg. So push the button, Dana, and let her go. Everybody, first thing, look at her hind legs, see if she's on the center line. Yes. Here she goes. She put her shoulders left. Good job. Now you can also see her pole to the left. And stop here for a second, Dana. 
Now these lines are to show to people very clearly that you have three lines, you have three tracks, you have lateral pole flexion, and you have a rider doing a pretty good job sitting uh, in the center of the horse with fairly balanced aids. So, so when a judge turn when the horse turns the corner, the judge starts and says, "Is the horse on the line? Yes, no. Did it move its shoulders in on the line?" Yes, no. Does it have three tracks? Yes, no. And all the time their eye is, is scanning up across the horse going, do I have a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of lateral pole flexion? I can't even see Joanne's rein and I am so confident she's in it. Can you feel it? Do you have the feeling that she's on her left leg to right rein and that the right leg is guarding. I, I don't even have to see it, it's like x-ray. I feel like superwoman. I can just see that she has this horse on the outside aids. It's very easy to see when it's happening and you get a really strong feeling about this. Go ahead, Dana. And, and then the horse- And Ida? Yes. Can I add, you can see even from here, the, the softness of the inside rein. Yes, oh, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. And this horse is just trucking along. Here she goes. Here it is from the front. And now, you, now, can you stop it anywhere there, Dana? Uh, well, yes. And well, she got a little bit, she's almost to the point where she steps back. But she, because this mare has a beautiful blaze, you could see this very slight lateral pole flexion in shoulder end. That's, that's the bend. Lateral pole flexion if there's if there's a tiny little flexion in that neck, it's very, very minimal. It's and not look at the engagement of that inside hind. Uh, yes, thank yeah. you, Joanne. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad you're here. So it's just amazing. And this is how you judge it. Now we're just gonna keep going to keep practicing our eye. So push the button, Dana. So as a horse approaches and she straightened back to the wall, she's, and when you're not sure, it requires more practice from the rear view. It is the toughest um, to see. And the most difficult is from the side, which we're not gonna talk about today. Here you go, you're gonna practice. Is the horse on the bit when it goes by? Do you think it's active and engaged? If you do, you're happy and you're thinking seven. Then you're looking, did it step in? Does it have flexion? And it turned back. Okay, and we drew, them, drew some lines on this. This is really cool here in this particular, uh, halt it right there if you would, Dana. You can see that this riding arena has a rut, which is great by the rail because it's got a rut wide enough for two feet and now you can clearly see that there's three tracks because the outside shoulder came to the edge of the rut which is great, you're going, okay, three tracks, no problem, we've got the lines drawn on. The next part is, God forbid, you're looking at a horse going, I don't know, it turned the corner, I liked it, I'm thinking seven or eight, it looked like it was on the bit, and I'm looking at it as a judge or a trainer, and I'm going, I think it displaced its forehand, but I'm not confident about the three tracks, and there's times when, it's dusty. How about they have feathers like this? Judges and trainers are always going, I, I think I, I'm looking, I'm looking, what can I see? And so the very next part of this is going to show you that if you're in doubt about how much angle there was, and the bend of course is gonna be the lateral pole flexion and some softness in the neck and the inside rein, then you watch the horse finish and it should straighten out. And when you see it straighten out, you can see how far it stepped over. If it's in right shoulder in, it's gonna step back over to the left and you go, oh, it was in three tracks because I can see how far it moved back. That's not a way to judge shoulder in, but it's a way to check yourself as the horse is finishing to be clear in your mind that it came into shoulder in, it went out, and it's still in a nice frame. And if you see the horse do that, it helps you confirm your happiness if you liked it. Go ahead, Dana. So the next part is gonna show us in shoulder end that the horse is in the three tracks. 
and she's approaching the corner and there's the straightening and she becomes absolutely straight and passes through the corner. Joanne, do you use that a lot? Stop right um, finishing and by straightening? Well, what, yes, if you're watching a shoulder in and, um, and you're really like, I'm not really sure about if it was wide enough or the angle was enough, is that, I mean, we were taught to do that in, um, as S judges, but yeah. not everyone looks at that as much, but that's a big thing for us. I think that's a good way to do it for sure. And then also how much engagement that inside um, hind leg accepts, you know, the acceptance of the inside hind leg. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes, uh, uh, yeah. And that is a little tricky, I think right there. Um, depending on if you have a level two horse or a level five horse, you're going to see a lot more adducting in a horse that is more advanced in its collection. Um, so yes, but you know how sometimes we see horses in sort of a level, a first level frame and a first level balance, and they don't have a lot of collection yet. And they're not particularly uphill, but they do come in, they're pretty active and they step into three tracks. They have some bend and they're doing okay. Um, we just won't see quite as much of that um, adducting and engagement uh, as we will later. And so they can still be doing okay, uh, maybe in like level two, test one, you know, because of the lack of uphill balance. But we're probably pretty happy with it at that point because we see a lot of people that have trouble just, they're just struggling to even perform the three tracks uh, correctly. But I think this is our biggest challenge in level two, don't you, Joanne? The shoulder in? Oh, definitely. Being able to see the three tracks um, when the movement's on the center line, that's one thing. But when it's on the rail, it's often very difficult to see. But you have to look at the overall picture. Like yeah. I said, the acceptance of the weight onto the hindquarters and the displacement of the shoulder. And um, I, yeah, I'm with you. And I was hoping that this kind of film would train people's eyes uh, to see it on the rail because um, if a rider and a horse can use the rail for about a year, their shoulder ends become way more confirmed. And uh, folks that don't have control of the hind legs very well um, come swimming around on the center lines. And a lot of times they can be several levels up before they actually get a correct shoulder in on the outside aids because they've been doing it um, without rails and without enough supervision. I know a lot of our folks don't always have uh, a lot of supervision, so they're trying to get themselves trained and without rails to keep themselves in line, it can be very, well, shall we say challenging. And you know, I, if I can yeah. add, sometimes the riders are looking for too much angle. Yes. And that's when they, yes. that, that's when they run into the leg yielding situation. And so yeah. they, in order to feel it, eyes on the ground are so important, as you know, or using a mirror, whatever. But in order to feel it, sometimes they have too much angle. Um, and so then they create themselves for themselves a leg yield. So it's so valuable for them to have somebody watch and say, yep, there it is, there it is. There's three tracks right there. Um, it feels like practicing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes, abs I concur. Here she is stepping into another one from behind. So that looked really good. You could see her step the shoulders in, um, no problem. And uh, and she straightens out at the end very clearly and makes the corner. Here we go with the markers. Uh, just for people that are training their eyes, this is what you're looking for to help you. Can you see the three tracks? And then, you know, all the time looking like, does she look relaxed? I, I love that this horse's uh, muscles in, the, in this day, they, you know, they weren't bulging, they didn't look tense. Okay, here's the common problems we see. Um, and well, a little thank you to Joanne and also me. Joanne was willing to just really bend um, Gigi's neck all around. And one of the things we wanted to point out was how bad just the neck is. In fact, you see Gigi did haunches in there and you're gonna see her resist in a minute because you do this to a horse that's very uncomfortable. She's gonna resist any minute, just watch her. She's starting to pin her ears. Then she thrips her head out and goes crooked. And Joanne just stopped there and let the reins go and patted her because 
it's really mean to ask a horse to do it. Let's stop there for a second. But those those kind of shoulder ends right there that are just neck are more than um, marked. They're marked down. Don't be surprised when you're getting into this level two and you're you know having difficulties. You're gonna if you struggle. That kind of an exercise that looks like that is going to be marked to three. And here is coming, we talked earlier about the exercise where the horse might be on, might be on the bit, might be moving right along, might have continuous impulsion, but it might only be a leg yield. And this is the perfect example of it. Go ahead, Dana, because this horse was on the bit going forward and it's four tracks, it's wide, it doesn't have bend. And, you know, it has to be marked a four. It is not a shoulder in. So here's some examples of things that can kind of go wrong. This one got a little wide and then the horse got a little unsteady to the connection and started bobbing around. You see her pin her ears and <laughs> that wasn't too good. Here comes the next one, five, six, not quite so bad, but still not super steady and mouth opening and turning around a little bit and wide less bend it was more angle than bend this one is a little better six five to seven mark it was a little bit tight not quite consistent to the aids not clearly on the outside rein and i lifted up the outside rein so she'd pull up her head and that shows you what happens when you pull up your outside rein you have tilt and they come off the bridle which was perfect. Here's a little uh, slight tilt and too much inside rein, six, five, seven. The horse looks active and she's uphill, really nice pole flexion, but uh, too much inside rein a little bit. So six, five, seven-ish. And some that have been scored better. <clears throat> Here's Gigi again. I'm so grateful, you know, to Joanne for helping with this kind of thing. And this is uh, our favorite horse, uh, Worf. Everybody knows Worf and his uh, costume freestyle. This is my absolute all-time favorite costume freestyle, but that was Worf. It's hard to see, and this is coming. I drew this little yellow around the tiny little bit of his head that you can see. And this is Samson just at the very beginning of his kind of working on his second level, working on his haunches in. And this is a horse that is beginning the haunches in. So as well as displacing the hind legs and looking for rib cage flexion, haunches in, four tracks, closer, you know, it's wider, it should be wider than shoulder in. We're going to watch it in video, but I wanted you to be looking at the area where his pole is coming around because when you don't see that, when the horse's head is completely hidden, then he's more likely to be just in leg yield or the judges are saying to you, doesn't have enough bend. And you can be out here 45, 50 degrees, you can be cranking them around all you want, but their heads are straight because one of the things that is required in this movement is lateral pole flexion is required. And if you don't get it, you're only gonna see just his ear and that's all he has to do. And it's almost invisible, but judges see that. We have eagle eyes, don't we, Joanne? <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, that would almost be like a counter. Sorry. If, that if he doesn't have that. Yes, if he doesn't bent, have that. Yield. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so that could elicit a very low score, very low, or because he's counter bent or he's showing no bend. And that is part of, we do see a lot of the leg yield, uh, the hunches in performed that the heads are kind of out. The hunches are in, but the heads are out and the riders are a little confused. Um, this is just a, a different level of horse to show you how much, and this is the a lengthened jog, so you have to do lengthened jog to the uh, haunches in, and you see um, a big, a bigger area of bend or a, a wider angle and 
uh, more cadence of the trot, but this is only because the difference is that was a level two horse. This is a level five horse. And it was just for comparison so that you could see a difference um, in how it begins and how it might look at level two test one and how it might look at level five. So that's uh, quite a, that's a difference. Whoops, sorry, going again. This is a difficult transition to the, from the length and jog into the collection and bend at a quick letter. So that's uh, kind of the demanding level of level five. Okay, some of the other skills that we have to get to, whoops, sorry, is the turn on the haunches left and right which also requires a uh, full rotation. And thank you again, Kristen, for being being the guinea pig. This is uh, this horse did keep the rhythm. He's just a little ground bound. He could show a little more full uh, suppleness. And there was one step where he stepped against her leg. He's going to turn right now. His pull was okay. He's beginning to step around. He has one step where his uh, right hind leg crossed his left. So we're likely to comment um, stepped against the leg slightly. But we need to keep thinking about what um, turn on the haunches, T-O-H, looks like as opposed to the pivot because you have that option in this level and you have to learn to be on the ball about is this a turn on the haunches or is it a pivot? This horse kept stepping all the way along and although it wasn't a perfect picture, it, they were both pretty good and would kind of come into the pretty good mark system. Okay, I'm sorry, we did not have a pivot. Um, and so I went out and did one the other day when I was freezing to death and the footing was frozen. And then I had forgotten that I did that at this level, we do not do 360s, <laughs> sorry. So this is a 360, but at level two, it would be a 180. How about if you give us your feelings and talk to us about pivots and what we're looking for, Joanne, and I'll play this again. He was muted, I think. So pivots <laughs> are, are hard to do and hard to judge. I mean, you've got, the horse has to keep the momentum. He, he doesn't need to be stuck. He does have to, um, it's real important on the pivot that he maintains the balance on the inside hind leg. Um, it, it's not uh, horrible that he lifts his outside hind leg because, you know, they can't corkscrew into the ground. So, um, but if they shift from inside hind to outside hind to inside hind, that's a problem. Um, maintaining momentum, maintaining the rhythm of, of the uh, pivot is important. Maintaining the flexion and bend. Um, let's see, what else? Um, looking as though the horse is being cooperative, of course, is important. Um, and all of those things contribute to a pivot. The, the most common mistake, though, is the, the horse will step wide and it's really not very advisable if the horse is stepping backwards. It has to have some forward momentum. Um, so those are all false if the horse steps backwards or steps wide or just does goes from a pivot to a turn on the haunches. And, uh, <laughs> that yeah. happens. Um, oh, yeah. Or more likely they start as a turn on the haunches, they start, start stepping and then they get some sticks and the horse starts pivoting, which is really tough. By level three, of course, we're doing just pivots and we have deleted turn on the haunches. So um, riders, if they have chosen in level two to do turn on the haunches, then they work on a new skill on the new skill for level three because it's required there, which is uh, good. You know, it's an, another skill. If you're already in level two and um, and you choose to start with the pivot and you do not choose to exhibit turn on the haunches, then you have just one skill, but both of these skills are very important. And one of the things that is um, good to talk about is the pivot itself is a skill which will be used and is used up through the double pivot in level five. So it's a it's an important skill and it has some times twos on it throughout the test as coefficients. So it's a skill you're going to develop and work on. 
turn on the haunches for all that it is it stops being exhibited in level two we no longer exhibit it it is actually the uh, developmental exercise for canter pirouettes and you will have to be doing it probably on a box on between the quarter lines as a schooling exercise your trainers will be having you do literally literally thousands because you don't can a pirouette a horse that much you do thousands of these turns in the walk uh, then you work on your balance and your collection separately and then you go on to the box in the lope and you begin quarter turns and 180 turns and it's that turn on the haunches from the walk so when people say to me, well, do you think that I should just skip the turn on the haunches and I should go directly to pivot as a trainer, not as a judge, because I'm wearing another hat, I tell them, no, because you will need that skill for your canter lope pirouettes and you need your pivots uh, also. And these are two different skills and you can work on them and you can work on them separately and you do not want to um, delete the turn on the haunches. And once you start pivoting, you need to keep working your turn on the haunches because you're going to need that for your lope pirouettes and those are coming. So it's very important to keep those both skills coming and be clear about that. Here is a picture, I'm sorry, I do not have, this is Tammy, uh, Tamara Steinbrecher, president of the Georgia affiliate. This horse gets pretty good, pretty good scores. One of the things that's uh, really incredible is that you just saw a horse, um, you just saw Lilith uh, pivoting, but she just had the tiniest little crossing of the front legs, which is okay. But this horse is amazing in his crossing. He does generally get fairly good scores on his pivots. And I'm sorry, I don't have him pivoting live for you, but a beautiful photograph from a professional photographer in a show one of the things that is absolutely amazing here is you can see the pole flexion. He is on the bit. You have a brider absolutely centered over this horse, her sternum and his sternum lined up. And look how, look how his tail has a slight flexion and it looks so soft. This picture impressed me. I just thought it was interesting. Don't you like that, Joanne? Absolutely. And again, look at him positioning himself on that inside hind leg. Um, I just want to make a point too, when you're deciding in second level, do I do a turn on the haunches or a pivot? Pick one. Um, don't do the same. Don't do a turn on the haunches and a pivot in the same movement. You know, don't do a couple of steps of a pivot, a couple of steps of a turn on the haunches. You can do on one side a pivot and on the other side a turn on the haunches. We just judge each movement separately. Um, and don't we don't, as judges, remember, oh, on that side she did a pivot. How come she's doing a turn on the haunches on this side? Doesn't matter. You can pick one, but not in the same movement. Don't don't uh don't change it up. Yep. Pick one or the other, right. Or they get or they get a four, don't they? If she right. starts one and finished as another it's an automatic four or down if anything else went wrong which is tough for for our That's right because we judge the criteria of the movement and if you start with a pivot then that we're assuming as judges you're doing a pivot and or you have to finish as as a haunches, yeah. we're making an assumption you're doing a turn on the haunches not yeah. a combo <laughs> combo four yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good here's a side pass um, let me push the button. Thanks again to Kristen. But what you're looking for in the side pass is slight full flexion in the direction you're going. Both sets of legs crossing, horse parallel to the long side, rider in the center, and horse in connection. Boy, I think she checked all the boxes on that day. It looked like it. Let's look at that again. So we're going to start with pole flexion. That was a yes. Both sets of legs crossing. Yes. Horse parallel. Yes. Rider in the center. Yes. Horse in connection. Not bad. And she walks forward and he's still on the bed. Um, that's, um, that's pretty good for uh, a level two horse to see side pass that good. Um, it's a new skill. We don't always see it that much. I'm not sure um, how it'll go um, with our new set of tests that our committee, that the committee for WD is writing.
but I asked them, <laughs> I asked them, no telling if they'll uh, take up my suggestion. I'd like to see side pass in all levels, including level five. I'd like to see it go all the way up. I think it's a good exercise for us. Um, it certainly helps in the pivots. It's a good exercise to um, repair pivots at times to help with problems and with aiding. And uh, I just think it's a great, great exercise for us. And so I want to see it all the way up for us. I'm hoping they'll consider it. Whoops. So we are back to this slide, which means that we're getting towards the end, but we're reviewing the fact that now I think by looking at the shoulder ends and the haunches ends and some of our other exercises, we're beginning to understand that now from level two through level five, and we were talking about this last month about as you go up through the levels, it's increasingly difficult to get really big scores. Like in intro or basic, it's not unheard of for people to get 80s. I mean, it's great, but it's common enough that people get 80s. But the thing is, is they are only exhibiting mostly this right here. And that relies on them being straight and forward and active and round to the bridle. But, you know, basic only has walk, trot and canter and uh, walk, I'm sorry, walk, jog and lope. And, um, uh, you know, some halts. And it has very simple geometric figures, but it does not have movements that have requirements. All of a sudden, when you're up in level three, four, five, two, three, four, five, there's not only this, but now there's these movement requirements and you can fail dramatically when you're doing a pretty good job with part of it, but maybe a requirement, a, a movement requirement fails. And so we were educating people to be more sophisticated about, wow, I just saw somebody score at level five and it was a a 67 at level five it is a pretty good, it's not a bad score because it's incredibly hard to get it. A 68, 70 at this high levels, these scores are difficult to get because it's not only this part, it's this part. And maybe while you focused on this part, that part got messed up. And Joanne was just talking to us about that, that um, possibly like in a shoulder and all haunches in, um, a horse is doing a great job bending, but maybe they changed their tempo, their balance, they lost their balance a little bit. So she referred to that as losing, you know, its rhythm wasn't quite as clear, uh, that kind of thing. So be, uh, be aware and be sophisticated about being a rail bird because as, and be aware as you move up the levels, do not be discouraged. Joanne, I wanted you to chime in with me about when people are approaching level one to level two, where you thought they ought to be reliably in scoring before they began to really consider exhibiting level two, how do you feel about that? I know uh, for me that I want to see that my students be reliably somewhere. I'd really like to see their tests be sort of like um, 67, uh, 68, um, 70. I want to see them in level one be very close to 70, which is only fairly good. How do you feel about that, Joanne? I lost her again. Okay. <laughs> and any... I'm back. Am I back? There. Okay, good. I think that, yeah, I think the writer needs to be solidly in the high 60s before they start dabbling in second level or level two or at least exhibiting it they could be they should be working on it yeah oh, but definitely. you always want to work uh, work ahead higher than where you're showing generally speaking so yeah um you know and don't get discouraged if you don't have perfect scores when you start showing in level two um that's how we learn it is, and um, we're so lucky that our judges are very clever in um, 
they're, I think they're generous. I feel like Western dressage judges are quite generous about commenting and they comment, I, I get the test back from myself and from my students. And I see there's a lot more commenting from our judges than perhaps from like dressage division when I get my dressage division students tests back, not so much commenting. There is some, but not so much. I feel like our judges here in Western Dressage are generous with their commenting and that commenting is what directs us as riders to what our problems are on the training wheel. Uh, she kept, it was, hey, she said impulsion four times in four different movements, wow. And then there was energy and walk, that's the same problem. I guess I need to address that. Or unsteady connection four or five times. Uh, okay, I need to address that. So I feel like they're very helpful with their commenting. All right, we're almost at the end of this here, but I did wanna thank you and ask if there were questions and how you felt about um, anything that we were working on today. Ida, we, have a, we had a question in the chat. Sure. You awesome. want me to read it to you? Sure, yes, ma'am. It says a bit off topic for this week, but last week we touched on errors. For example, walk steps in move off in level one. Should that be considered an error? Anyway, how does WD 126.6A address repeated errors? Well, I think, you know, I made a I made a I made a remark saying, you know, it's almost like an error because you did not um you did not go directly in level one from halt to jog, which you should be doing. But I don't think most judges would actually in WD give an error, but you, but riders, I was trying to shock them into thinking like, I'm not gonna make that mistake. Because when you do get to higher levels, you need to think about it as like uh, a gate break. You know, if a level five horse comes up to a halt, and walks four or five steps, then that's either gotta be an error and you ring the bell and they gotta do it again, or it's going to be an incredibly low score because at that level, they have been doing walk to jog for levels and levels and levels and it wouldn't be okay. In level one, you know, I think we're gonna be kind of generous, but it, you know, you're not, I wouldn't give an eight or a seven I wouldn't because you have already been through two levels, well, one level at least, basic, and there's one test and in intro where you should have exhibited halt to jog. And that's a lot of tests. And you should be able to halt to jog. And that's a, and other than the rest of the line, there wasn't a lot there more to do. I don't know. How do you feel about it, Joanne? Because that's our judge education judge educator, and maybe I should just hand that over to her and see if she agrees. <laughs> um, we, we wouldn't consider it an error, but uh, definitely your score would be lowered if you are to walk, or I mean, jog to halt, and you, you have walk steps in there. If the test requires jog to halt, halt to jog, that's what we should see. And then if that doesn't happen, the score would be lower, but it would not be an error. We have been seeing in level one um, a lot of competitors live and online that because they have walked out of the jog, uh, walked out of the halt into the jog uh, so much at intro that they're still in level one, not really understanding uh, halt to jog. So this question came up because um, I'm not sure. I don't remember who. I think it was Joanne uh, Williams mentioned it. That, that we were seeing this a lot as judges and that it would be something, she was warning competitors like, you know, that's a simple thing, like don't make that mistake. <laughs> so like that was, that was where she was going with that. Any other questions, Mary? No, good. Thank you so much. Next month um, is all about um, alignment and um, Riders alignment and um, balance, um, and how it relates to developing collection. So we will be talking about how the riders should be aligned and their equitational problems, which affect collection. 
before we go on with level three and talking about continuing with the other movements, we're going to address this issue next month. 